Hello, and welcome to our panel on Chainlink Proof of Reserve with some excellent guests who have integrated Proof of Reserve and their pro protocols use it every day. My name is Dr. Andy Boyan from Chainlink Labs. Call me Andy. Today, we have a great lineup. If you're unfamiliar with Proof of Reserve, it's a way for smart contract projects to show on-chain proof that some asset is in fact held in reserve. In the cases of our guests today, they hold different assets in reserve, but use this type of chain link oracle to provide on-chain data showing the assets are really there. So we've got a few discussion questions and we wanna have a chat about what Proof of Reserve does for your products, your communities, and of course your roadmaps. So our guest today, introducing from Armonino, a top accounting firm in the US, Director Noah Buxton. Noah, I'll let you give yourself a more thorough introduction in just a mo moment. Uh, we're also joined by CTO Lu Wang from Ren, a top cross-chain bridge protocol, securing billions in value across blockchains. And finally, from True USD, we have CEO Rafael Kosman. Welcome, everyone. Rafael, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about True USD uh, and what you provide to the DeFi ecosystem. Absolutely. Thanks for having us on, Andy. So, um, True USD, it's a US dollar backed stable coin that's backed one for one with US dollars held in real bank accounts. And um, the proof of reserves product allows true USD to show on chain that every single true USD is backed by an actual dollar. And so we're used by protocols like Ren um, and other protocols on chain to directly and directly uh, pull that feed from, you know, it goes through Chainlink, they pull that feed directly from Chainlink and they can see the reserves backing it. So it's a very powerful way that with true USD, we're able to inspire a higher level of trust that you know, it really is a stable coin that's fully backed and you know the money is going to be there, not going to be any sort of rug pull or concerns about the solvency. Fantastic. Thank you. Lung, why don't you tell us a little bit about REN and your role there? Yeah, so um, REN is an interoperability protocol and one of our biggest use cases that we've seen is the moving of BTC to Ethereum. Uh, and uh, my role in that project is as the chief technology officer. So I oversee um, sort of the, the technical development of the project uh, and make sure that everything you know, is moving along smoothly and that we're using the best technology that we can be using. Um, and yeah, in the context of that, we, we use Chainlink's proof of reserve to sort of uh, show again in a similar way to uh, TrueUSD that we, we do in fact have the Bitcoin uh, on the Bitcoin chain that backs uh, the Bitcoin that's being represented on Ethereum uh, when it's there. And then people can be sure that they can uh, redeem that at any time. It's a little different from TrueUSD in the sense that our protocol uses this uh, in, in a decentralized way. So we're not actually custodians of this money, um, but still it's a good feature to have. And, and I, I'm sure we'll dive into exactly why it's a good feature to have. Uh, over the yeah, those of differences are really interesting um, and to see how different people are using it. Uh, Noah, uh, why don't you give yourself an introduction? Tell us a little bit about Armanino and uh, your role in the space. Sure, thanks, Andy. Yeah, so Noah Buxton, I'm a managing director here at Armanino LLP, which is a top 25 public accounting firm in the US. Uh, I lead our blockchain and digital assets practice at the firm. And really what we focus on is being the tip of the spear for this industry and for our firm. So that kind of manifests in two different ways. Uh, some of the more mundane pieces are, you know, tax engagements, uh, audit engagements, right? We ride along in these sort of traditional services that accounting firms provide anyway, but with that crypto expertise that's needed to address the, you know, the needs of the players in this space. Uh, the other thing that we do that uh, I'm a little bit more passionate about, if I'm being frank, uh, is build new tools that are directly tailored for the industry. And uh, really our focus there is solving trust and transparency problems. And there's many of them to solve in crypto. So we stay very busy doing that. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we've developed a platform. We do that really in one way. We address those problems today with a platform we've developed called Trust Explorer. Um, and actually, uh, its, its inception was in response to a client need, actually working uh, with Raphael and his team to provide more trust, more transparency uh, around the true USD asset and the dollars that sit in bank accounts. So um, it was a novel kind of case where an accounting firm could do something more than sort of a paper audit. We actually used the technology itself to try and solve that problem. Uh, and initially it was just a transparency sort of dashboard, but it's grown to be something much more, which maybe I can talk about a little bit more later, layer that in. But yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna turn back to Raphael. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what proof of reserved did for your protocol? Like, and, and what was sort of the decision process there? Was it 
protocol and we need transparency or, or, or how did that come about? Well, so, you know, when we launched True USD in March, 2018, it was the first USD backed stable coin after Tether. And the reason we launched it was because we looked at Tether and we thought, wow, these folks have built an amazing product that is in massive demand. And at the time, Tether was, I don't know if it was, you know, at a hundred million market cap or something like that. I mean, it's grown some, you know, some huge multiple uh, since then. But we thought, wow, it's huge. It's growing really quickly, but they've got major issues around their reputation and around their transparency and not being able to procure audits. And so we thought we're gonna build a stable coin where we're gonna do everything right and not just get audits, but really push the envelope on what's possible. And so taking that to the next level of getting real-time audits, real-time attestation, where it's actually, um, our Menino is attesting to those funds 24 seven and connect via API directly to our banking partners that are holding the US dollars. And then now um, with the proof of uh, reserves product working with Chainlink to take that attestation and you know, put those attested funds actually on chain so that now protocols can, can reference that data directly. So this is re it's really been a multi-year journey of how do we make the most trusted, uh, most transparent stable coin that we possibly can, largely in response to just the, the lack of trust that we saw in the crypto market before we came in. Well, thank you. Lung, same question to you is how do you decide to use proof of reserve? Like what, what are sort of the tipping points there that may say we've got to have this transparency on chain? Yeah, sure. So when we set out to build Renvium, um, obviously the first point of order is to think about what's the, the best way to make sure that these funds are secured. You know, you're sending your Bitcoin to this uh, decentralized network and it's going to create a representation of that Bitcoin on Ethereum. And then at some point, you want to be able to burn that representation of the Bitcoin and reclaim the actual Bitcoin under, underneath. And in order to know that that's going to happen, you need to know that there isn't more REN BTC on Ethereum than there is BTC held by the REN protocol. Um, because if there is, then you know, you're not going to be able to redeem it and you're going to have all sorts of solvency issues. And so our first thing was to actually like, you know, go into the network and the, design this decentralized and trustless protocol that for which that just can't happen, where the funds just can't be stolen. But no network is perfect. And there's always a chance of problems. And so once we were kind of done with that and we'd gotten to mainnet, we said, well, what if something does go wrong? You know, what if the worst case scenario happens some attacker gets a hold of everyone's computer somehow and, and convinces them to do something incorrect. Um, how can you mitigate that? And you really can't. I mean, once the money's stolen, the money's stolen to some degree, um, which is why you try to protect it in the first place. But with a proof of reserve, at least what you get is the ability for other applications to react to this in some way. So they get an instant and real-time feedback on um, the sort of safety of RenVM. Uh, and they can see this history over the last year that RenVM has been solvent for that whole time. It's been doing its job that whole time and has seen no failures, which can give them trust that the system is maturing and is, you know, does what it claims that it can do at a technical level, but then also gives them the ability to react to it if something does go bad. You know, they can pause their contracts, they can engage governance, they can, you know, yeah, do some kind of automated thing to, to mitigate the damage to their ecosystem, even if they're using an asset that does get compromised in some way. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, Noah, I'm gonna turn the question to you a little bit um, because I, I do wanna know why proof of reserve made sense for Armanino, but then also you're an accounting firm. So it's a little bit of a different, like you, you don't need to provide safety for specific assets. You need to provide good information for clients. So like, how does that start and how do you guys approach that, um, uh, this sort of technology? Yeah, so I think it starts um, with a, an ethos or at least a, strategic uh, approach to the market, which is really that all assets in some form or another become digital assets. Uh, now, is that aspirational? Yes, but I truly believe that's the path that we're on. Uh, the power of tokenization um, and smart contracts, STOs um, have the power to, and we'll look at what is happening in NFTs right now too. Obviously that's a huge movement in that space. So every, if everything has the power to become digitally representative, excuse me, digitally represented on chain, uh, the fact remains that there's still plenty of real world data that needs to feed those ecosystems or feed those assets to make them, to make them actually operate. And so uh, to me, it's, it's really just a case of if we believe that, um, then shouldn't we be involved in completing the loop? 
And what I mean is the first half of the loop is, can you tokenize something? Can you make money uh, programmatic? Can you, um, can you, you know, make a money vending machine on chain? Yes, you can. Um, the other side of it is, well, can you bring real world information into that on-chain ecosystem to complete the loop, right? So that um, now you have uh, many examples, but you know, one thing comes to mind in the future, uh, a tokenized limited partnership that's based on real estate holdings. Can it, can it know the value of real estate? Can it know the income of the property? Can it know the expenses that were paid from the general ledger system? And could it also distribute dividends to limited partners in stable coins? The answer is not exactly today, but 100% possible with, with things like trust and transparency layers like Trust Explorer, with uh, Oracle networks, right? And trusted data sources off chain, all that's possible. So long answer, but basically uh, we believe this is where this is going and, and simply being involved in uh, proof of reserve like scenarios and off chain proofs is just part of the equation. No, this is great, right? This is starting to get into the weeds a little bit where, you know, we, we can take a snapshot of what's on chain. We can see that. That's not hard. But how does an Oracle change that? Or, or, and how does the solution is, well, you can do something with it with a smart contract, like distribute dividends or uh, a real tokenized real estate and, and, and do some things. So here's a follow-up question for the floor, um, which is like, uh, what are some of those use cases that if people have this information in a smart contract, they might do? Loon, you mentioned backstops, and I heard you guys have talked about circuit breakers before. Um, uh, Raphael, you started the talk, so I'm going to call on you for this one. Uh, but can you guys just think a little bit, have fun? Like, what's the use case brainstorm here that people might want to uh, um, put this stuff together in their protocols? Yeah, well, I, I think that the um, this is still very early days for having this kind of data on chain. And so there still are, there still aren't that many protocols that are actually consuming it yet, but I think down the road, it's gonna be more and more. And um, Andy, as you mentioned, you know, the, probably the number one use case is going to be um, some kind of, of backstop or of pausing of, of usage of a certain protocol or a certain token, where if you knew that there was an issue where something isn't backed or there was a hack that's being investigated, the first thing you might wanna do is like transfer uh, is it pause transfers of a token or you know, pause deposits or withdrawals of a token into a protocol. And um, that being able to hit that kind of pause button immediately, if there ever was a hack or an issue with a token, that's extremely valuable. And that can give protocols a much higher degree of, of safety, knowing that, okay, someone's not gonna be able to run away with all of our protocol, all of our protocols funds um, if you know a, a huge number of tokens were to be all of a sudden minted because some keys are compromised or something it's like actually that. Actually, great, a great example of this that happened like in the last twenty four hours. Um, really? There was a, well, so in, in the in the super so in this post interoperability world that obviously the Ren team is very interested in, you have this kind of weird concern where maybe Ethereum is functioning perfectly and maybe. You know, RenVM is functioning perfectly, but what if another chain that's interoperating with Ethereum stops functioning well? And what happened uh, recently was there was a, a bug in the Filecoin API, which when you queried Filecoin for a transaction, it would give you back the, tra the transaction, but it could also sometimes give you back a previous version of the transaction that was actually no longer included on chain. So it would give you the actual transaction or it would give you the double spent transaction. And people were using that to, I think they drained... Uh, like several million dollars from Binance using this technique. And when you have an interoperability protocol, if it's acting perfectly, but the actual underlying protocol, let's say Filecoin is, is behaving poorly, then you could drain funds out of a DEX. You could drain funds out of a lending protocol by leveraging that bug in the other chain. So you could actually compromise um, another network based on, uh, you know, you're kind of only as strong as the weakest link. And so having a, right. uh, an Oracle that it can tell you, you know, something has gone wrong, <laughs> pause everything. That can at least give your community time to react and yeah, prevent the draining of funds um, or yeah, to pause that, that chain you know, entirely perhaps. That's no, right. Like, but, so but, in, in that example, okay. is if you, if you had like a, you know, like a tokenized file coin as an ERC-20 on, on Ethereum, then you know, the, yeah, the moment there was a single double spend attack, and someone is, you know, withdrawing a file coin that they shouldn't, you'd want to immediately pause all movement of those tokens and it address the issue. You know, hopefully to shut everything Actually, down until that bug on the fraudulent side is. 
it was actually the opposite. It was that you could send a Filecoin to an exchange, get your Filecoin in the exchange, ah. but then not actually sent it. And then you just keep doing this and, and then you sort of end up with this, a, a lot of, uh, you can sort of turn maybe a, a, a million dollars of, of Filecoin that you have into $10 million on another chain and then use that fake $10 million to drain assets. You know, you just sell it all for ETH or something and then you're, you're good and clear. Um, right. Well, fascinating real time. Uh, like uh, reserve, that becomes impossible. Uh, no, I'm going to turn this to you because my next question is very related to this. It, uh, my next question is how does proof of reserve differ from a traditional audit? Um, and it sounds like this is one of those use cases. It's like real time. I know you guys are monitoring all, all the time, but um, so can you, can you address that? And then can you also talk about like what goes into, just for some of our viewers, what goes into a regular audit? Like where do people in the accounting world come from when we're, they're talking about doing an audit? And so like what kind of barriers are they, do they have to get over when they get to a proof of reserve or smart contract type solution? Yeah, happy to. We were just talking about a very interesting crypto exploit, cross-chain stuff. Now we're going to talk about audits. So hopefully I don't put everybody to sleep here. Uh, so I, I think, let me say, say this, they, uh, a traditional audit engagement and something like proof of reserves on chain are very different, uh, but they're also very similar. So the way I kind of think of this um, you know, imagine you're a, a co-founder, you're someone running a business and your venture capital investor requires that you provide audited financials. So they're looking for the financial health of your business, right? They want to know that the investment that they made is, is being put to work uh, as they would expect and what the returns on that are. Um, that is obviously very different than sort of what we're talking about today, bringing some off-chain piece of information. It might be related to stablecoin collateral or commodity, commodity token collateral, et cetera, uh, or, or a staked asset cross-chain. Um, and that is very different than, excuse me, I th thought I lost my connection. Um, very different than uh, a traditional audit engagement. Ultimately, audit engagements come down to assertions. And in the audit world, it's existence, valuation, rights and obligations, cutoff, things like that. These are not foreign concepts at all. They're actually lay people, not in audit, can totally understand this, right? Existence, does the asset exist? We deal with that all the time in crypto, right? Like, probably not your keys, not your crypto, or sign a message to show me that's your wallet. Valuation, uh, that's the largest use case for Chainlink today, right? Is to provide off-chain Oracle pricing sources. So valuation, just a different use case of it. Um, rights and obligations or ownership, right? Is that actually your asset or have you encumbered it some other way? Um, and so again, they're very different. The ultimate uh, products or outputs here are very different, but the spirit is the same. Can you provide a third party, a need to know party, uh, reliable information about um, a financial position or a collateral position, et cetera. And so, you know, there's different audit standards um, uh, across the globe, you know, here in the, in, in North America, in the U S it's generally accepted auditing standards and public companies, publicly traded companies have a yet higher standard. Uh, and internationally it's um, IFRS. Um, so, which is a similar standard. Um, you know, I think, let me just say this to put a capstone on it real quick. I think that the, uh, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by this space is that the, the gap between what's possible in traditional audit and manual sort of stuff and what's possible with distributed systems, on-chain systems, Oracle systems, it, the difference between those things is growing at the pace of technological change. It's, they're moving far, far away from each other at a very quick pace. And so, you know, I'm selfishly interested, uh, as a practitioner in finding the gap between like, how can we, how can we use the technology itself to close that gap? Yeah. Yeah. Andy. Um, so audits m might not be the most exciting topic on their surface, but that's how we get adoption, right? If a banker comes in to, to view this, we, we gotta be able to explain to them, like what's the language you understand and not, and, and vice versa. We need to explain to crypto people, a smart contract audit is not the only kind of audit that we're talking about here. Raphael, go ahead. That's right. I was wondering, just so that people can get a more tangible sense of what these audits and attestations are like. Um, since we have, we do have video here, could I actually just project and just um, do a quick walkthrough and just show our viewers what's what goes on on the attestation dashboard and so on? Sure, go for it. Okay, so if folks haven't seen this before, um, this is the actual 
uh, real-time attestation for true USD and the other true currencies. And so this is based on uh, NOAA's team from Armonino connecting to our banking partners via API in real time 24 seven. So you can see it's showing here true USD, there's 319 million tokens minted on the blockchain. And NOAA, um, your team also actually runs their own nodes to uh, get this number, right? Yeah, that's right. That's important so for you're us. Not dependent Dependent on Infura, it's not dependent on Etherscan. You know, this is an actual third-party auditing accounting firm, an auditing firm that is running these nodes and reporting that this is the true number of tokens minted on the blockchain. And similarly, they're inspecting the bank accounts directly via API and reporting that this is the escrowed fiat and that the collateralization status is 100% plus, which is great. And the same is true for all these different tokens. So that's really the core of what's going on here. Anything you'd add to that, Noah? Yeah, I didn't know we were gonna do this, but this is great. I think the, um, the, you know, this is kind of an application. I mean, it looks like, it looks like the front end of TrueFi, right? It looks like Aave, it looks like looking at the Ren Dark Node dashboard, right? Like, but this is, a, this is totally different for an accounting firm to put this kind of information out. Um, and there's definitely some, you know, additional, I feel like legit, legitimacy that comes with that. Like it's pretty difficult for us to get to this level. Um, but also down here um, on the page a little bit, you can actually go and download a report. So if anyone wants to, to play around with this, what you're, you're, you're getting is a system generated report. Um, yeah, you can select all, for instance, they'll download a zip, but these are 30 seconds aged. So this kind of shows what I was talking about, this closing the gap between you know, the traditional audit and what is totally possible today with technology alone. And so, you know, audit reports for financials are done yearly and they're issued three months after the period. Um, you know, the best you get in the stablecoin world um, outside of true USD and, and the other asset, true, uh, true currency assets is, you know, a monthly report and it's issued a few weeks later. It's stale by the time you get it. These are 30 seconds old and they're issued, you know, downloadable on demand. So that's, I think, the sort of... Uh, you know, paradigm shifting, I guess I would call it sort of level of transparency that we can provide. And as accounting firms, we should be doing this kind of work, so. Yeah, it reminds me of um, a change for, of campaign finance, electoral finance, when you can start seeing who campaign donors are uh, for elected yeah. officials, like getting them to the elected officials to that point where reporting that data took some requirements, took some, some uh, uh, legal encouragement but really it has changed the way that we, we understand uh, the political system. Uh, Lung, you guys are dealing yeah, with uh, sli <laughs> slightly different assets here and slightly different auditing processes. Like what are you guys using or what are you guys um, uh, seeing people use these proofs for in terms of audits? What kind of questions do you get about them? So, I mean, I think to this stage, I'm not actually aware of anyone that's integrated the proof of reserve contract for BTC on Ethereum as a backstop. Um, we're considering implementing it ourselves as a backstop. So for example, having the RAM BTC token automatically pause itself if the Oracle detects that there's an issue. Um, the, but the thing we've seen in most, I guess, is that people have used that history as a way of seeing that RAMVM has been legit for the last, or since it launched, right? So if you're coming in, you know, the interoperability space is really just beginning. Um, and, you know, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, we only have a billion dollars of assets under management, which is, is quite small things considered with the DeFi community these days, um, which is amazing in and of itself to show how far the community has come. But if you're coming into the space and you're still getting used to this idea that Bitcoin on Ethereum is even a thing, um, you know, you may have never heard of our project. You, you don't necessarily want to read through um, you know, the history of all our medium blog posts and everything like that, but you can just go on chain and you can look at a at an Oracle and, you know, see that at no point did it ever freak out and say there was an issue that for the last, you know, 13 months, RenVM has been running smoothly and has always been one-to-one -one backed. Um, and yeah, that hasn't, hasn't been compromised. And I think that that can instill people with confidence to understand that this technology does in fact work, which is, I think really important for us because it is really new technology that there really isn't anything like this in the space yet. And I, I think we'll see more instances of what, you know, the kind of technology that RenVM is coming out and, and becoming more of a thing. But at this stage, it's completely novel. And, you know, so I think 
getting people on board with a completely novel technology, getting them to trust a completely different type of, of system, um, this proof of reserve really goes a long way in that. And, and I do think that in the future, when people start understanding these systems in a little more depth, we will see them begin to uh, use these proof of reserves more directly. Uh, an immediate example for that is, you know, if um, you think about something like ne uh, uh, Nexus Insurance, you can completely automate that by using a proof of reserve um, instead of having to then go out and sort of source some kind of voting system from, from members of the general public uh, or your token holders. Um, right. You know, you can, you can have that insurance automatically pay out instantly, um, which is probably, a, I mean, and, and in general, this, this can be probably be something that can happen in the future is have these more automated insurance pipelines um, that leverage things like oracles and proofs of reserve. Another thing yeah. that I think dovetails off that is just an example that comes to mind is um, this is inevitable. I think these, you know, uh, proof of reserves, reference contracts, you know, for Oracle networks, um, sort of proof of off-chain data is inevitable because if you just analogize it to like traditional equities markets, um, there's a whole legacy infrastructure of people process and technology that go and audit public companies and produce quarterly reporting and year annual reporting and investor presentations. Um, and a lot of that has come really become really accessible for consumers, right? That used to be the stuff of you probably, maybe some of people have heard of it, Edgar. Are you going to go log into Edgar and go download a 10K for a public company? The majority of people are not going to do that. Uh, the majority of people today are not going to go uh, look at a proof of reserves reference contract. But what it is, is the infrastructure of trust and transparency that markets need, right? This is the stuff that secures markets. And so today I can go on Robinhood. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't because of recent activity, but um, I could go on Robinhood. And if I wanted to look at a public company stock, I can look at this 10K or annual filing information right there on my phone. I think that the, the truth is that um, what Chainlink is doing today inevitably will trickle down to the end user experience and user interface eventually as well. But right now it's like this behind the scenes um, infrastructure of trust that's being built. That's the way I see it. Well, I mean, one of the chain link yeah. methods is always build the infrastructure and then let the creative developers figure out what are they going to do with it? How are they going to use this proof of reserve to build this new insurance protocol that's different from Nexus, that's different from, you know, so-and-so and, and iterate in, uh, in a really interesting way there. Raphael, did you Andy, have a... While we're on the topic of chain link, if I could just briefly show the actual chain link price feed. Um, this is the chain link price feed for TUSD reserves. Um, and Luong, we could show the, um, the BTC one as well. And then you've got, I think, something like $700 million plus of BTC um, that your protocol is custodying, which is, which is very impressive. Uh, but this is, this is just showing this is ch the Chainlink oracles are reporting on chain. It looks like right now there's six oracles that are active. Kyber is a little bit delayed, but they're actually reporting right now that there's $616 million um, backing the TrueUSD. And you know, this should get an update within the next, it looks like hour and a half of an updated number. So this is, this is data that the that smart contracts can consume directly from the Chainlink Oracle uh, you know, using you know, a pretty significant number of oracles so they can really trust that this is accurate. Yeah, I, I love this page. We just had this page revamped. So like it look, it's a look different look and feel. It makes a lot of sense. We're pretty um, uh, pleased with how it looks. Yeah. Those oracles, those are independent Oracle providers. They're part of the network, but like they're part of the system. And so, um, you know, to, to coordinate with each other would be a really significant uh, uh, effort. And you can kind of see network performance there and everything. This, exactly. this brings up an interesting point, if you don't mind, Andy, around uh, auditability, you know, that's enabled by these types of um, on-chain feeds is there's kind of, I think I've heard Sergey talk about this a little bit when he's talked about capital market stuff, but there's, there's kind of in my mind, two big buckets of, or types of data that can be provided back on chain in a useful way. There are things like price, price feeds are a great example where prices are um, abundant, right? Up, up around different marketplaces, right? The, the BTC ETH pair is abundant, frankly, across, you know, however many hundred global exchanges. And to pull that in, in a reliable way, benefits from decentralization of Oracle providers, right? That's, that's, that's what secures that data feed is that decentralization. But there's so many valuable use cases for off-chain data that aren't that way. They're not 
They're not ubiquitous, right? They're not on many different exchanges or many different places. They're actually maybe a, a single source of truth, right? Uh, a company's own internal books, um, a fund manager's actual crypto holdings, uh, the value of a piece of real estate. Again, you know, the list goes on. Some enterprise data, for instance, that's proprietary. Uh, that you could just build a huge list of these single source of truth pieces of data. And so to me, there's Oracle networks, but there's also um, a way to secure these data feeds. This is kind of my philosophy around this and why we invest in Trust Explorer and believe in it. But these, a system like Trust Explorer can provide a layer of reliability ahead of going on chain, right? Like the reason that the true USD collateral feed on Chainlink is valuable is, well, yes, it's decentralized in the way it's picked up, but it's also that the source of truth that it comes from is reliable It's in, in its inception, right? And so I think that's kind of, I'm not sure if that lands for anybody else. But... I have a question for you, Noah, on, on that. Um, right. So obviously I think, I mean, I know nothing about the auditing world, so thank you. that is a pretty condition. <laughs> I assume that, you know, as an auditing company, you actually have to have some level of qualification or some certifications or, or some official thing that you have to do to be allowed to do these audits and actually report that data. How do you think that plays with an Oracle network like Chainlink where you know the dashboard that we just got shown there has six, for want of a better word, random nodes mm -hmm. uh, attesting to that data? Um, how's that going to have to change in the future when you know other financial institutions and financiers need to know for, the, for their own legal um, purposes that this data is actually coming from a legitimized source as opposed to six randoms that, that aren't certified to actually be auditors? Mm -hmm. Interesting Thank question. You. Yeah. I can raise that awfully. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see if I can answer this the right way. I, yes, there are a lot of things that as an accounting firm we have to do to uh, maintain a license, right? Both individuals that work here to maintain CPA licenses as well as the firm itself. Um, as well as to meet standards in the engagement, right? There's lots of hoops, frankly, that we have to jump through um, to meet the standards. Um, so how does that change? In a, way, in a way, it's actually something that's always been, uh, not a problem, but there's always been this sort of friction you're talking about around, well, there's sort of data or information or reporting from companies that's available, but not audited. Right. And then there's sort of the audited information. So I think the same is kind of true today. You've got, but I, well, the difference is, I guess, that, you know, in a protocol sort of instance, we're talking like Ren, for instance, when you theoretically users can go look on chain on both sides, right, and get the transparency themselves. So in cases like that, um, I think that there's, there's reason for whatever, some third party to understand what they're looking at. For instance, do we need to go audit the REN VM and, and check and reconcile as we do, right? That there's an asset locked here and there's a representative asset over here? No, not really, not for most users. Um, so I'm not sure if it's ever gonna be one thing or the other. I think there's a lot of use cases where the traditional audit hat is still very useful. And then there's a lot of use cases where technology does it better, I guess, or protocol but does it better. So I'm not sure if that addresses the question. I'm gonna throw that back that. to. Okay, oh, go ahead, Rafael. Andy, I'm sorry. I know we're 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 discussing a lot of stuff and it's kind of stealing your show here. But <laughs> no, it's great. Is this you know, an audit right now, All of these, all of these, you know, your your firm is actual, you know, certified public accountant, right? Yes. You're yes. licensed and everything. These oracles that are providing this data on chain. To my knowledge, don't have any sort of special licensing. Has has your team ever considered themselves becoming an oracle, uh, running one of these nodes and putting the data directly on chain? Because folks down the line might want to see, okay, not only is this attestation coming from an actual CPA, but but you know at least some of the oracles that are putting it on chain are actual CPAs as well. Is I'm that something that you that consider? Question. Do you think it would make sense for Chainlink to have a feature that? for some feeds requires all nodes to be licensed in some way. I know that kind of seems counter to the ideas of cent uh, centralization versus decentralization. Uh, well, I won't make, I won't, so to Raf's question, I won't make news today, so to speak, but I will tell you that I do know the steps <laughs> of becoming a, um, a sort of a node operator on the Chainlink network and uh, the security review that you have to go through. So um, it's not that there's nothing, right? It's not that anyone can just, 
participate exactly. I mean, theoretically you can, but you have to meet certain requirements, right? So right. Um, I'm at least aware to that level, which means we've investigated it. So I'll tell you that much. Um, Cause I think, yes, there's something promising there. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Loon, to your question. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I really believe in decentralization in many, many cases. I think that for instance, with price feeds, decentralization of, of feeding data is a really great way to trust that data. Um, I think there are other cases that are less compelling for decentralization and trust and, and that, yes, sometimes the identity of the participant or their stake, for instance, right, um, their skin in the game also matters. So um, I can't give a clear answer one way or the other, but I think, yes, there are use cases where you might want to know that it's coming from a trusted source versus just any participant. Yeah, Lou, I'm going right. to throw your question to Noah back back to you and say, I, I think there was a lot of discussion several years ago about like, why would any company ever take Bitcoin onto their balance sheet when you've got all these validators around the world and you don't know who they are. It could be anybody. Um, and yet still we see people are taking it on their balance sheet. They're finding that decentralization valuable. And while that took some years, it is clearly a, a valuable use case. Dark nodes. Who are these dark nodes? They're called dark nodes. Like, uh, I don't know who they are, but it's decentralized. Once you kind of understand the mechanics of that and how it's incentivized and secured, it makes a lot of sense to, to some people. Uh, gentlemen, I think we're actually kind of running up on time here. We've had a, a really great discussion. Um, I, I'm going to give you each kind of just a minute to tell me, like, what is your project up to next? Give us just a little snapshot. Not too much alpha if you don't want to, but... Um, uh, uh, what do you have going on? Loon, let's start with you. Um, yeah, so we're about to bring in a whole bunch of new chains. Um, we've just recently brought in Binance Smart Chain. Um, we're about to bring in a bunch of other, what we call destination chains, so places that you can send your assets to. And we'll follow that up very quickly with the ability to send tokens between chains. Um, so it's, as opposed to just, you know, uh, Bitcoin going to Ethereum or going to, let's say, Binance Smart Chain, the ability to actually take a token that's already on Ethereum and send it across to Binance Smart Chain as well, like ETH or even RenBTC itself. So you can take RenBTC that's on Ethereum and send it straight over to Binance Smart Chain. Um, so really connecting that full web of all these different chains, instead of having this kind of hub and spoke model where you've got BTC and it's going out to all these different chains, having all these chains fully interconnected. Um, that's kind of what's next on our, our roadmap and probably a few months away from that. Fantastic. Thanks. Oh. Noah, you gave us a little hint of at least what you're researching, but what do you guys have on the uh, agenda for the next year? Yeah, so kind of three strategic objectives this year, but uh, definitely involve expanding Trust Explorer uh, to new use cases. So uh, today, Trust Explorer provides real-time a test over about clo close to $5 billion in crypto assets. Uh, oh, there's many in the pipeline that are interesting use cases. So we're working on client integrations and client integrations mean more chains, uh, more third-party sources, banks, brokers, uh, and blockchains and, and exchanges. So uh, lots of that. And also uh, Oracle services is a actually in our strategic objectives for the year. So we're working hard to wow. find these. Yeah, exactly. Ref. Yeah. So um, working hard on more uh, valuable off-chain use cases that we can bring on chain and continue to be really participating and proving out uh, this thesis around completing the circle, as I called it earlier. So. We put these at the back cool. of a, uh, a video so people like have to watch the whole thing and get the real good alpha, uh, but they'll find it. Thank you. Raphael, what do you guys got coming on? Wow. Um, I just wanted to say first, we love working with the Armanino team. We've at Trust Token, we've been working with them for years and it's great. And everything that they like, they're, I, I think I could say maybe the only accounting firm that we've ever met where they will build like interesting, well designed, like legit tech, new products. They will genuinely build new products that are innovative, that really push the envelope on what is possible in terms of accounting and attestation. Um, it's been amazing to us every time. So no, I'm very excited to see the um, what you're doing in terms of oracles when that comes out. I hope that we're going to be the first to use it. You're the man. I didn't pay him to say that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you just have to keep working with us, though. That's the deal. Done deal. Um, the, so what we're working on is, you know, on top of True USD um, uh, and other stable coins, we are now building an a protocol for doing uncollateralized lending. 
And that is, of course, another place where uh, auditing and attestations and bringing off-chain data on-chain plays a huge role. Um, and you know, what we see is that there, there's been a tremendous amount of growth in DeFi in, in these collateralized lending protocols like Maker and Compound and Aave. And those, you know, those protocols, they make complete sense. They've got a very, very strong um, position within DeFi, but we really think the cutting edge is in uncollateralized lending. It's a tougher problem, but with higher reward if you can solve it. And so we, we launched TrueFi in November. Feel free to check it out at truefi.io. And um, right now it's a place where you, know, you can get you can do lending with your stable coins. You can get fantastic rates, 40, 50, sometimes 60% APY directly on your stable coins. Um, and we think it's one of the hottest, most exciting things in DeFi today, but we're totally biased. Um, that's what we're up to. Fantastic. Well, we'll get all these links in the show notes too, so people will be able to click them. Uh, that is our time for today. This was really fun, uh, and uh, I really, I'm really glad we had this conversation. I can't wait to do it again in person sometime. We'll make it to a conference. We'll uh, uh, make it an interesting panel, maybe invite some other people uh, as well. So thank you to our guests for joining us. Uh, we know, you know taking the time out of a founder's busy schedule is hard, so we really appreciate that you guys made it. You're taking the time to explain how these new solutions, this new technology works. Um, it, it's discussions like these that will help us grow as an industry. And of course we are growing. And so again, the time is very much appreciated. With that said, again, I'm Dr. Andy Boyan from Chainlink Labs. Take a look at our proof of reserve blog posts and developer documentation if your project is interested in learning more. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us on.